Well, this is not too bad. Seeing as how all the, a lot of the people at 10 o'clock figured uh, surely it's too icy for me to make it. All right, we were working on tension members. We had mostly done plates up till now. We had discussed, oops, uh, if you would put your homework in there. And if you would give him that when he's finished and then pass it up and down the rows. One of them says submit. One of them says return to students. As of now, the submit bucket is light. The other one's heavy. When it gets over to you, it'll be reversed. Okay. We were talking about yield stress and ultimate stress for various steels. I don't remember. It's been a couple of days since we were there, but if you look on the previous page in Sugui, page 43, that must have been what we were talking about. He's discussing it more. I think we've discussed it at length, so I think you'll be okay. Uh, lecture one flipped class goes through using that table in detail with you if you still got questions about it. Three quarter inch bolt. Um, just to show you, here's six holes in a plate. There's your three quarter inch bolt. The true hole size is one sixteenth inch bigger. That's so you can get it together. That's for fitting it up. And because you drill it or punch it in a rather unsophisticated way, you leave marks all over it, which kind of hurts about another sixteenth inch of steel around the hole. So whenever you do the following calculations, which we're going to work on, you will assume a hole size <coughs> diameter of the bolt plus a sixteenth for fit plus a sixteenth for damage. You will see a hole diameter of the bolt plus a sixteenth inch. You'll see the guy pick up a drill bit of that size to drill the hole. Uh, that specification is in page 16.1-18, and it's on page 2-48. I guess the 248 is for F sub Y and F sub U. I try and put my little notes pretty close to what he's talking about to account for possible roughness around the edges of the hole. Here is that spec and some other specs that we were talking about. Here's how you find the gross area. Gross area is total cross-sectional area right out of a table. How you turn that into a net area. That includes the fact that you drilled holes in it. Net area is the sum of the products of the thickness of the net width computed as follows. Um, net area for tension and shear, the width of the bolt hole shall be taken as a sixteenth inch greater than the dimension of the hole. So you'll notice that uh, specifications require you to pretend you've destroyed an extra sixteenth due to damage. How much bigger you want the hole to be so it'll fit? He doesn't care. That's your problem. But it is conventionally one sixteenth. That's why you only see him adding one one sixteenth here. He says, go look at the hole. Say, how big should the hole be? He says, I don't know. That's your problem. Practically, you should take the bolt diameter plus a sixteenth of an inch. He says, now, I don't care how you got that. If you've got a quarter inch bolt in a two inch hole, that's your problem. No, no problem. But because you drill that hole, you make whatever that number is one sixteenth inch bigger due to damage. Sometimes you'll read Segui and he'll say bolt size plus a sixteenth plus a sixteenth. You look in here and he just says plus a sixteenth, you get confused. Because Segui starts from the bolt size, tells you practical added size plus damage. This guy doesn't know about practical, he doesn't care, that's your problem. All he's worried about is the damage part plus 
a single sixteenth above the drill size, which is, of course, a sixteenth bigger than the bolt size. There's sometimes these things will zigzag around. We'll get into that, but we'll be coming back to this page. I'll try and refer to the page number, 16.1-18 in AISC. This is where I've stuck it in our notes, pretty close to Segui's page 44. Now, he's going to start talking about an effective area. And we've already done a little bit with plates. Plates are very effective. They're very efficient. The load P comes through here. And it slides down one, two, three bolts, about a third of it very nicely through shear between the uh, top plate and the bottom plate and comes out through the bottom plate. And about two thirds of it's left and it comes down in here. A third comes through here. There's three thirds here, a third is taken out. There's two thirds left, about half of that comes out. There's one third left and it comes out. And those, believe it or not, they're reasonably close like that. Not because the bolts are so accurately put in the holes, but more than anything, if you put one of the bolts and it bangs up against both sides in a hurry, then you put another bolt and these holes don't line up very good. First thing, this bolt will yield and it'll reach a peak number. Then this bolt will get a little bit of load. And you say, oh, I didn't know you guys were even loading things. This guy says, oh, yeah, I've already... Just because I was where I was located, I, I've already taken my share and I'm through. Uh, the rest is yours. And so all of these bolts will pick up loads evenly. That's pretty efficient. It's a little inefficient because the load P in the bottom plate and the load P in the top plate don't line up perfectly uh, by this number here, T. If this is T and that's T, well, that'd be T over 2. They're two different size plates. I don't know what this will be, but it's a little bit of moment in that joint. Not enough that we worry about it. Not enough that we see it hurts our load carrying capacity. We ignore it. U is how we will take care of inefficiencies in a joint. U is equal to 1 for a plate bolted to a plate. The true behavior of the load when you pull on this side the load comes down through the plate. The stress comes down pretty nicely and uniformly. And then first thing you know, these little pieces of load, these little stresses, notice there's nothing there but air. And so, so they start bumping shoulders with these people. And they say, look, you're going to have to move a little bit because i got to get around this hole. They go around to the back side of the hole and they press, they bear against the bolt. That pushes the bolt to the left until it contacts the plate underneath. You see the see that plate underneath there? And then the load goes through that side of the bolt in bearing, then it goes down in the bottom plate. In other words, it's really coming around here, around the hole, and it's pressing against the bolt. And then this bolt being pulled that way is also really coming through here and pressing against that bolt, and those two loads are shearing that bolt. Bolted plates, the, affected, the effective area is, well, this is not, the area effective is always equal to U times the net area. The net area is the area with the holes in it. But for bolted plates, U is a 1, 100% efficient. Why? There are no outstanding unconnected elements. In other words, all of the elements, mainly both plates, are connected to something. The times you really have problems with this efficiency of the joint is when you have an angle bolted to something and the top piece of angle is hanging out in the air and the load is running down the 30-foot length very nicely until you get towards the connection and all of a sudden all the little stresses and loads in the top piece of the angle that's not bolted anything, it starts saying, move over, move over, get out of the way, i got to get down there to that plate. It becomes inefficient. But with a little bitty moment arm like that, not a problem. Yes, sir? That is 
true, but they will not let you put too few. Because as you're probably thinking right now, and I think I got a picture of it somewhere, if you only had one bolt, then the fact that, that those two points don't line up very well, that caused a heck of a moment on there. As long as you got a lot of bolts in here, that moment is resisted acceptably. And they, so they just code it out, or they just spec it out. They just say, can't do that. Got to have at least so many bolts. All right, and well, and here's somebody who did that very thing. Here he has a five by three by half inch angle. The five inch leg is laying down on the plate. The three inch dimension is sticking up in the air. The loads are coming down, kind of trying to get through this bolt. The loads that come down this piece of steel, this top piece, find that their element is unconnected. They say, "Gee, I shouldn't have got in that." train. I should have got in this train coming in through here. Now i got to figure out how to get all the way down here and get through this bolt down into the plate. Basically, this piece of the entire angle isn't even loaded. And so you know these guys are sliding down in there. That causes higher stresses around this point in the uh, angle, and it causes it to hold less load. You say, well, what can we do about that? Well, not really anything. You just have to suck it up, and you have to admit that the angle around the connections are not as strong as you were planning on it. You'll help matters a lot if you'll make the, the connection longer. The length of the connection is considered to be end to end of the bolts. So that would be L. In this case, you don't have to worry too much about it because here L is zero. And when you divide by zero in the equation we tell you you should be using, you quickly say, okay, I don't think I like that. So you can't just use one bolt. The eight and a quarter plate, eight by a half inch plate. The loads have much more time to get down in there because you have a longer connection. There's still an unstressed part of the, flame, of the angle up there. That's still true. In this case right here, you see the person laid the five inch leg down, stuck the three inch leg up in the air. The centroid, the number that we're going to use, well actually the real moment arm is the distance from the center of the plate to the centroid of the angle. But we just, the equations in the specs just call for you to use the number from where the shear surface is to the centroid of the outstanding, of the the angle's centroid towards the outstanding leg. They say this part here, we didn't count it a minute ago, and we find we don't have to count that little extra moment in this case either. But we've got to count something. This is on page 1-44, and I've got some stuff on the next page. This was much better. He still took the three-inch leg and stuck it up, and it is now unconnected, and the distance from here to here, uh, uh, best I remember now, bet you, I think I looked that up. You'll have to check and see if I'm making a mistake now or if I made it this morning at 3 o'clock. I think that number is how far that centroid is from the back of the angle. If you really wanted this extra thing, you'd have to add a half of a half inch plate. Here's a guy who thought he was doing great, has the same number of bolts, has a nice long connection, but he didn't know what he's doing. He stuck the five inch leg in the air. So now then, the moment arm is, well, it is the moment, that is the moment arm. The truth is they just don't make you go all the way to the center of the plate. They make you go to there. I think as much as anything, we're not even sure what plate we're going to use yet, and we need to go on and get on the design. And the guy said, look, it really doesn't make that much difference. The real problem is this piece here. And so the specs call you to find the number from there to there. And it's in the tables. There may be some reason for doing that. The guy says, look, I don't have any choice. It won't fit the other way. It's just he's going to take a hit on strength. Here's where you find those distances from the back of the angle. Here, I can check that right now. 
that I have written here from the back of the five inch leg to the centroid is 0.746 for a five by three by half inch angle. Here's a five by three by half inch angle. That's Y bar. I want X bar. See, I want to know how far it is from here along the three inch leg. And that's X bar. And X bar, that's Y bar. There's X bar for that angle is 0.746. That is, I did have the wrong. I was showing a moment arm. And they don't really use a moment arm. They use how far it is from the back to the centroid. Now, there are two Y's and X's shown here. One is the distance to the elastic. One is the distance, yeah, to the elastic centroid. And one is the distance to the plastic centroid. You're not interested in the plastic centroid in a connection. It's uh, You need the elastic centroid. So you'll see a Y bar which is what you'll use, and a YP. They're both shown almost the same. I can barely see there's a little difference there. Here you pull the right number from the tables. Uh, what is the P and A? I have no idea. Don't, 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 don't just look in the book and find something. What is the J and XOR raised to E and expect an answer? Go go talk to somebody who does steel, man. I don't do steel. I do water resources. <laughs> PNA, plastic neutral axis. I don't know if that's right, but uh, <laughs> he's not gonna. Yeah, he's not gonna rebut it because I don't know. Tell you how you find out. You go look in the glossary, and he's got everything. Big U, shear lag factor. Little Y bar, <laughs> plastic neutral axis. Look, there he goes. Look at him. He's back in the glossary already. It's in the front of chapter 16, not in the back. There may be another one there where you're at. Okay. Now we're going to design or analyze a plate. Could be asked to do either one. It's a half by five inch plate. A36 steel uses a tension member, so this is an analysis problem. Once... Uh, you to assume that the effective area is the true area, because he says you weren't supposed to have told him yet about that U, the reduction in strength, because the centroids don't line up so so badly. Assume it's a 1. That's not a problem. It's going to be a 1. Uh, what is the design strength for LRFD? And then what is the allied strength for ASD? We don't do any of that. When he asks for the design strength, he's asking you to go find out <clears throat> what the specifications say the 305 strength is going to be, the average of a 1,000 tests. <clears throat> and then he wants you to multiply it times a resistance factor to turn it into a design strength. That's the design number. That's how much load you can put on it. Now, here he drilled the four holes like this. He could have drilled them in a straight line. The plate would have been stronger, but the connection would have been longer. The reason uh, one of the problems with this plate is going to break across two holes, so you're going to have to subtract two holes from your cross-sectional area. Here it is in three dimensions. It's five inches deep. It's a half inch wide. This is a five-eighths inch bolt plus one-sixteenth due to fit plus one-sixteenth due to damage. It's a three-quarter inch hole, effective hole size. See something like that, you know, holler. See something called P&A in a book, you don't know what it is, don't ask. Okay, first we're going to admit that the thing may yield across its gross section. In other words, once the long 30-foot length of the member yields, it may get so stretchy that it just can't support the loads to our satisfaction. That's called gross section yielding. For yielding of the gross section, we calculate the gross area without the holes, five by half, two and a half square inches. We apply the yield stress to the gross area. That comes right out of the table for F sub Y and F sub U. Two and a half square inches times 36 KSI. 
this thing will average out, if you tested a thousand of them, at 90 kips. Some of them won't make it up to 90 kips, and so you're not going to be able to use 90 kips. And I don't know which one it is, but I know my luck. It would be mine. So nobody gets to use 90 kips. That's nominal. Going on to fracturing through the holes, the net section, our net area is the gross area we already calculated, two and a half square inches, minus the holes. Well, here are the holes right here. These holes are three quarters inch tall and a half inch wide, so three quarters times a half, and the failure plane runs through two of them. Just because you drilled four holes doesn't mean it's four holes. You drilled four holes, but the load first found a plane of weakness at two holes. So you have a half times three quarter times two. You subtract it from the gross. It leaves you the net area. Because it's a plate on a plate, that is also the effective area. 1.75 square inches. So this is true for this example, but A sub E doesn't always have to be A sub N, so be careful. And the nominal strength from your 305 work would be stress times area effective. It's 101 kips. One policeman says you can put 90 kips on it, and then I'll shoot you. One of them says you can put 101.5 kips, and then I'll shoot you. I go for this number here, the lower of the two. Yes, sir. That is indeed, because, see, the bolt is going to be five-eighths. It's back in... Why do they multiply the three-quarters? Well, see, this is the height of the hole. That's the height. The width of the hole of the steel that you lost was a half. And then there were two of them. Then the nominal strength, your 305 strength, for fracture across the uh, net section area... Uh, stress times area, you get 105 kips. Now, you still don't know who controls here, and so I really should have, shouldn't have stopped there because the policeman doesn't get in the game at this stage because this number is going to have to take a little hit on strength because it's just yielding, and that's not too dangerous. This thing here is fracturing, and that's really a serious thought. And so it's going to take a 0.75 hit where this one's only going to take a point nine hit, so I still don't know who's going to win. So going ahead and putting the uh, resistance factors on there, point nine of the 90 and point seven five of the 101, turns out that the limit is 76.1 kips worth of strength. Design strength. Now that still doesn't tell you if the thing is going to work or not, because nobody yet has given you loads. You still need this number to be compared against a 1.4 dead, and against a 1.2 lap plus a 1.6 dead, and so on and so on and so on. Yes, sir. Well, um, it talks on these pages that we're marking, you know, um, this is where you're getting, picking up the, the strengths. Let me see if I've got this right here. Right, that's in the commentary somewhere, but it's all, let me just see here. No, but usually, you know, here we go. Uh, F sub Y, A sub G on page 2-48, and pretty close to it, it's going to be the same thing. They're going to have the fee factors right next to it. So it's all, in other words, Segui hadn't done anything on his own here. It all came out of the, out of the specs. And uh, somewhere in here, I'll have those. But, you know, who knows when they'll finally show up. Here's effective area. There's effective areas. 
The only only thing I know, if I haven't written it down again, we must have written it down some some on some earlier page that we worked on. Uh, give me that page number that you found it in the just in comments two dash twelve. So it's on page two dash twelve. But I'm telling you, if it doesn't say sixteen point one cent point something, it's just a note to people. Okay. All right. All right. I gotta go on here. I don't want to not answer your questions, but I may have to put a note and then ask me after class if you can't find it. Here. Probably right here. There we go. I don't know. I just didn't notice. 16.1-26. All right. Now then, we got our F sub Y and our S sub U. Here's where we got it. We got it on page 2-48 from our uh, material strength tables. Uh, he says, it looks like we've kind of forgotten stress concentrations on those holes. He says, if you remember your 305 work, these holes had very high stresses on the inside, not so much on the outside. The P over A you're using is down in here somewhere. But he says, we really have it because uh, what happens is that the fiber that's highly stressed reaches yield, and then first thing you know, all these stresses reach yield, so the final stress distribution before the plate really breaks really is uniformly distributed. He says, if you remember from your 305 work, they would go up to about three times as much. He says, more than twice the average. Here's actually the thing come out of our 305 book. They can be three times as much. We don't care if they're three times as much because once the plate starts to yield, it hasn't broken. But it just quit picking up load. As you keep putting load on the plate, then this fiber stops adding stress but doesn't drop it like a piece of glass would. This fiber then reaches up there. Then this fiber reaches up there. And then this fiber reaches up here. And now then everybody's starting to move up towards F sub U. But you've already been told to stop at F yield. Next example, we've got a single angle tension member. It's a three and a half by three and a half by three eighths. There it is, three and a half by three and a half. Doesn't matter which leg he sticks up, but I'd always lay the long leg on the bolted side by three eighths. It's connected to a gusset plate. Seven eighths inch diameter bolts are used, therefore, they're going to use an effective hole as one inch. Going to use A36 steel as usually expected on the, out of the steel tables. Service loads 35. Now we're going to get to compare with some loads. 35 dead, 15 live. He wants to know if it meets specs. He says, if you don't mind, I'm just going to pretend that you know how to use the number U, even though you don't, just so we can demonstrate how this problem works. It says, once you get a little more sophisticated, I'll show you how to pull this U out of a table or calculate it. The load comes down and fails through only one hole, so be sure you only subtract one hole from the uh, gross area to get the net area. Here are your dimensions where the holes are. We don't really care where they are in this case, but this if this is a three and a half inch leg, this is first hole is out here at two inches, and there is only one hole. You can't get two holes in that one. Uh, here's the solution. The gross area comes from page 1-46. Nominal strength is equal to this comes from table blah de blah. And there's your two and a half out of table uh, out of Page 1-46, the table on that page, gives you 90 kips of nominal strength for gross section yield. Moving on to net section fracture. The, book, the, the specs always call it next net section rupture, but our book kind of flip-flops between the two, so don't be confused. 
Here's the gross area. Here is the diameter of the bolt plus a sixteenth worth of fit plus a sixteenth worth of damage times the thickness of the angle. That's this little area right here. This picture shows two holes in there. <clears throat> Can't get them in there. They won't fit. So it leaves you a net area of 2.125 square inches. Please reduce that strength by 15%. You say, why? Because times that area gives you this much uh, net section. That net section, since it's so short, can be run all the way up to the ultimate strength. You don't have to limit it to F sub Y. 58, one point. 806, 147 kips. Then we go back and say, what's this times 0 0.9? And what is this times 0 0.75? 0 0.9 is 81. The 0.75 is 78. Net section fracture controls the situation. So you must make piece of ultimate, your request for ultimate load, less than your design strength. Less than a resistance factor times the nominal strength. Until you start getting familiar, nominal strength, uh, design strength, those kind of names, you're going to be confused. So our design strength is 78.5. It's a smaller resistance. Now he says, when only dead load, live load are present, you don't have much choice but to have one and two because all the others are for snow and wind and rain and earthquake. And if you don't have any of that, then you're not going to have to check those equations. He assumes you know how. And almost all the problems in here just have live and dead load in them. Here is where he got his numbers for, for those angles. Here was his gross area for a 3 by 3 by 3 eighths inch angle. Two and a half square inches, I remember, that's right. Here is X bar. You would use this X bar in calculating U. In his case, he just says U is 0.85. Pretend it is. So we didn't really need X bar, but there it is on the next page. Uh, and here are those dimensions on where you can put these holes. Now, if the holes are given in a problem, well, then that's where he's going to put them, whether it's very workable or not. But on the last page of your angles, you have a small table that tells you workable gauges and angle legs. So if you have a five-by-something angle and you want to put a single set of holes in it, you come down to a five-inch angle. That's the leg size. And... If you only want to put one set of holes in it, that's G, G, you'll put them at three inches. That's where you ought to put them. That's where everybody expects them to go. They'll fit nicely. You can get a wrench on them. No problem. If you need to jam two rows of bolts in here on a five-inch leg, then they recommend that you, here's the long leg, you go at G1 and G2. So on a five-inch leg, you go two and one and three-quarters. Two to the center from the back and another one and three-quarters to the next set of holes. If you want to stick two rows of holes in a four-inch angle leg, good luck. Since you have no numbers, you can't do it. They're just not going to fit. You might, you could get them in there, you could drill them in there, but when the guy with the wrench comes at you swinging it, then you'll know you shouldn't have put the holes there and put the bolts there. He can't get the stuff in there to connect it up. That's on page 1-48, last page of the angles. Now back to our problem. Our problem still had the loads to be calculated. 1.4 dead. The dead was 35 kips for 49 worth of total load. That's during construction. During the life of the building, when load really got way out of hand, I very rarely see this happen. 
1.6 live could be the guy miscalculated the dead load by 20 percent so 66 kips you must take the larger of the loads that you calculate you take the smaller resistance and the larger of the load your factor of safety there's your factor of safety there's your factor of safety and there's your factor of safety and it's safe we've been doing this now for 20 years 30 years since 66 calculated is less than how much what is that number called design strength that's correct is you, are you sure that's not nominal strength yes she says <laughs> okay yeah it's not nominal because nominal you can't use. You gotta multiply it times a resistance factor. Here's a pair of double angles back to back. He asks you to assume that the effective area is 0.75 of the nominal. We'll get into how to calculate U shortly. Most people, and I would suggest they have double angle stuff back there, but sometimes it's kind of hard to remember how to use it. If I were you, if you had two angles, I just go get one angle strength, and then when you're totally finished, multiply it times two. Howdy. Uh, same thing, gross section yield, yield times gross area, 36, it must be A36 steel, that angle is a 5 by 3 by 5 sixteenths, long legs back to back, means he's laying the five inch dimension back to back and he is sticking the unconnected element which is three inches long out that's a good idea <clears throat> gross area for that angle is 2.41 square inches I don't know if I bothered getting the table for all of them I just get usually one to show you how so you pull that out of the angle properties you're going to get 86.76 kips worth of gross section yield. Now, considering the holes in there, there are two holes in a single angle. The dimensions where they're at that doesn't matter, but it is a five-inch angle. So this one's at two. That one's at 1.75. Uh, the size of the hole, uh, the bolt is a half-inch. So add an eighth to that. Four eighths plus an eighth is five eighths. There's your five eighths. The thickness of the angle T is five sixteenths inch thick. There's two of them. There's not times two of them. There's not two angles, are there? What did we agree to do before we started? Only do one. What is that two for? That's right. There's two holes drilled in that angle. Okay. Times two is subtracted from the gross, leaving you this much net. The net is to be multiplied times U. Soon you'll be able to do this without his help and asking you to assume. Gives you this much steel. Nominal strength is that much steel, 1.514, 1.514 times the ultimate for piece A36 steel gives you 87 kips of strength back on the previous page we had 86.76 there's your 86.76 on this one we have 87.81 there's your 87.81 this one is not too bad please knock it down by 10 percent this is not too bad please reduce it by 25 percent 78, 65, there's your uh, strength. And he says, since 68 point, 65.86 is less than 78, where did the 78 come from? Original problem. On the next page? Okay, okay, yeah. Then it is acceptable. And uh, two times that. That's because you got two angles before you go home. Uh, 
I don't know. I guess I just, those are pretty, I think. I guess I drew another one. All right, now then, effective area. Several of these things, you have outstanding elements that aren't connected, and they reduce the joint efficiency. That's called shear lag. Because what happens is you have a little, oh, I know why I did that. You have a little element in here, and the load comes down. You know, it's, it's really, I guess you should show his, his intention. The tension load comes down, and here's the little element, and it pulls in some direction on that little element. And then as you go down here, the shear stress is a little different as you go down into the thing because the shear stress in this one is guaranteed zero because it's touching the air. And so the shear trying to get down in here actually lags. And uh, so that you can get this condition of no stress, no tension stress at all, where there's guaranteed no tension stress because nothing's connected. Now, I have ways of com com computing that. First off, in 16.1-27, yeah, I knew I'd get to all of these things where they're coming from. You'll find his insistence that you reduce the net area by a shear lag factor and get an effective area, one that you can really use in your calculations for strength. For welded connections, the effective area is going to be the gross area, not the net area, because if it's welded, you have no holes. So in a welded connection, the net area minus no holes is the gross area. And therefore, the effective area, but the effective area can still be reduced. For instance, you can have a plate, and I think that's also something I showed up here. No, I still have holes. But if you weld this plate, and this is the only place you can weld it is at the bottom and maybe on the sides. You still have this problem where the stress can't get through the air down into the plate. So whether it's welded or bolted, you can lose strength due to this U factor. Now we break these U calculations into two general things. Number one, we know what it is. If you'll just tell me what you're doing. If you're doing an angle and you'll tell me the angle, and you tell me how many bolts you're going to use, the length of the connection, then I, have no, I got a really good equation. You can calculate U right on the money, very close. But if you say, well, I've got the angle, uh, or I'm trying to design the angle, but I don't know what size bolts I'm going to use, and I don't know how many bolts yet, well, then I'm going to just have to give you an approximation of what we find for that kind of a structure. So it's pretty well broken up into, if you really already know the connection, then this is a category, the, these three categories you'll use. These things need to be scratched out. I don't know if they are in your book now or not. Things change. If the connection is unknown and you say, yeah, well, if I don't know the connection, how could I know the connection? So I'm trying to design the connection. Well, then I'm going to give you some alternate values that you are permitted to use in the design and then when you find out what you're planning on using, then you actually got something to sink your teeth into. Probably ought to come back here and uh, design it with the numbers that, I'm, that are correct. Not just these should be pretty close. Another reason you probably want to do that, as you might imagine, these numbers have to be pretty low because it's going to have to cover all the things, all the ranges. And we say, well, okay, just make him use a .6. No matter what he usually gets, it'll always be better than that. The equation they found after years of study and a bunch of other equations that worked out okay, but this one worked better, is U is equal to 1 minus how far does the centroid of the unconnected element stick up in the air, what a dumb thing to do, divided by how long is the connection. <coughs> So, here we go. Here's what the person did. They have an unconnected outstanding element. 
There's your X bar. Now, in the book, it may be listed as Y bar because the book lists, shows all of his angles, you know, sitting some way. I don't know which way, you know, it depends. Long leg up, long leg down, whatever. But if you're looking for this number here and the angle sitting in this direction, say that's the five inch leg and that's the eight inch leg, he's going to list that Y bar because to him it's Y bar. But when you say, well, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to lay it on the plate this way and I want X bar, that's Y bar out of the tables. You're going to have to orient the book to fit your needs. And L is how far it is from here to here. And if you're willing to extend this gusset plate on out and put some more holes in it, what happens to L? Where the dang equation go? There it is. Look what happens to L. L gets big. X bar for that shape stays the same. You subtract less loss of strength. You don't have as much loss of strength. You get a bigger number, and U is a bigger number. That's as it should be because as the connection gets longer, the load has more time to duck down into the plate below. That's on our page 51. More information is on page 51A. It's on page 16.1-28. And this is Segui's equation 3.1. He refers to it later. X is the distance from the centroid of the connected shape to the plane of the connection. And L is the length of the connection. And Yes, sir. L is from center to center of the bolts. Center to center of the bolts. If you say, well, gee, I've got an extra uh, foot of angle over here. Well, I don't know why you've got an extra foot of angle over there. You know, maybe your dad sells angles, but you don't get to count it in the length of the connection. Yes, but nobody would do that because nobody would do that. All right, now then, here are the real values of U. Above here are the ones they really tell you what the things are, but you've got to really tell him the angle you're going to use, and you've got to tell him the plate you're going to use and that kind of stuff. Down here, if you say, I don't know, well, then we're going to let you use some approximate numbers. For example, for a wide shape, miscellaneous shape, American Standard or HP shapes, or T's cut from them, it says, incidentally, once you find out the re what you're really going to do, you go back here to case two where I numbered the same things, you're welcome to use these numbers up, these equations. But if you don't know what's going on, then... If your flanges are connected with three or more fasteners in the direction of the loading, that's not too bad, three fasteners. It would be a lot better if you had four or more fasteners. And if the B sub F of the flange is greater than two-thirds of the depth, you get to use this. But if it's not, you get to use this. They're trying to find ranges of things where you can just go ahead and pick a number to get started with. The good equation is this one here, where you take 1 minus x bar over L. Uh, here, for example, here's an angle. This is the one that makes the most sense. There's your x bar. Here's your x bar where you put it. The L is the length of the connection between the bolts. There's your L. 1 minus. It says all tension members. He says, please don't use this for plates and don't use it for hollow structural shapes where the tension load is transmitted to some but not all of the cross-sectional elements. That's how you got in this problem in the first place. Or longitudinal wells. And these things take some thought. You, know, you really do have to sit down and look at what he is telling you and, and where you go in these things. All right. Thank you for coming, the half that's here.
Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Let me. I'm going to be doing clean, cleaning up here, but I'll listen. I do not. My office hours are. See, this goes there. Okay, so I came and talked to you about this earlier this week. Excuse me? Sorry. You're in my way. I apologize. <laughs> Shame on you. And I know that these numbers that uh, the TA wrote, or the Gator wrote on here, I know where they came from. They came from using um, the modulus of elasticity if it's... If we I came and asked you about this in class, and so... Yeah, well, it's for this problem here? Yes. Is it, and you said this turned out not to be steel? Well, I, I used the monitor yeah. that I found, which yeah. they said is correct. So that's what I used. Yeah, so I don't know why you're not right. That doesn't make any sense to me, except probably the solution manual. The guy just used E for steel because he's so used to it, which is wrong. Uh, so, you know, you're... No, I got to get this done. I'm sorry. See, I get off on these things. That's how come I say I won't answer questions. No, no, 